Steffi, I have to start by saying that without you, there would not be DLD at all. And we are grateful. Thank you. <laughs> As our friend Steffi says, there's this become this tradition at DLD where I kind of take the stage and um, yell at my European friends. And I want to explain why that is. It's because uh, in addition to being a proud American, I am a member of Team Liberal Democratic West. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, but, and I think, is anyone in this room not a member of Team Liberal Democratic West? And the reason that's important is we should be very, very proud of ourselves because in the post-war years, I think that the Liberal Democratic West has created levels of prosperity and freedom and security that are unprecedented in human history. And I want to keep that going. And the reason I want to talk... Thank you. Please feel free to applaud a lot. But the, the reason I want to bring this topic up today is that it feels to me like there, are two, there have been two main pillars of Team Liberal Democratic West, North America and Europe and the EU. And one of those pillars is, to me, it's falling behind in some troubling ways. As a friend, as a member of the team, I want to highlight that and talk about what might be going on. So I'm going to phrase it, and we have a tale of two gaps. And I want to try to be clear about what I'm talking about. The starting point for a lot of this work that my team and I have done is uh, the Draghi report, which came out last fall. How many of us are familiar with the Draghi? Yeah, it was, it was a big deal for good reason. It's fantastic. And it does this beautiful job of laying out the situation and laying out the problem. So I want to quote from the Draghi report a couple times. He, Draghi does not mince words here. He says, we will have to choose. Trade-offs exist. Economic prosperity eases those trade-offs. And without economic growth, the trade-offs become more severe. And without it, Europe will have to scale back some, if not all, of its ambitions. Okay, those are fairly plain words. I think Draghi uses even more as plain speech. Oops, uh, he points out that productivity growth uh, in Europe is not on the right trend. Look at the post-war years. Look at that astonishing increase in productivity, which is really the wellspring of our prosperity. And by, at the turn of the century, at the start of 2000, Europe was within about 5% of American labor productivity levels. Then the trend reversed, and right now it's closer to 80%, 20% behind. That is not a happy trend. I can't tell a good story about that. And Draghi is extremely clear about the implications of this. He says, for Europe, this is an existential challenge. And the report covers a lot of ground. My favorite part, the part that I concentrated on, was when he talks about technology, innovation, and the ecosystem in Europe. And he, I want to quote a couple sentences from the Draghi report about the state of the innovation economy and the technology ecosystem in Europe. And I'll, I'll highlight a couple things. Weak in the emerging technologies that will drive for future growth, stuck in a static industrial structure, and failing to translate innovation into commercialization. Weak, stuck, and failing are not good adjectives <laughs> for the technology ecosystem. So it brings up what I think is critically important homework for all of us members of Team Liberal Democratic West. Why is this happening? And what are we going to do about it? So I want to spend a bit of time on why this is happening. Why has tech fallen behind in Europe? It is a rich, technologically sophisticated part of the world with a great educational system and iconic companies and iconic innovators. So what's been happening? And I hear a few explanations and I want to spend some time on them. The first one is, is it a lack of government research funding? Let's make this audience participation. Would you raise your hand, please, if you think this is one of the big reasons that Europe is falling behind? Yeah, I'm not fooling very many people, am I? So here's a great statistic that I was not aware of from the Draghi report. Here's comparative research funding in the US versus the EU. So I wanna show a number of comparisons here. And in each case, I'm gonna benchmark whatever is going on in the US at the number 100, and then we'll look at what's going on in the EU. So if the US in 2024 was spending 100 units of government support for research and innovation, Europe was not that far behind. Europe was at 88. This is a gap. 
This is not a gigantic gap. And in per capita terms, Europe actually spends more than the United States does. Okay, so I wasn't fooling very many people. Question number two is that the lack of venture capital investment. Hold on, hold on, don't raise your hands yet. <laughs> okay, fine, raise your hand. How much do you think this is an important gap? Yeah, um, I, I believe that, that this is, we'll look at how big the gap is. I believe this is a very, very important part of the high-tech ecosystem. I was actually underestimating how big a deal this is, and my eyes were opened by one of the, one of the best books I've read le recently. It's called The Power Law, written by a European financial analyst and journalist, and it's about the role that venture capital played, particularly on the west coast of the United States in Silicon Valley. And I think this is an amazing quote. Uh, this is a very, very strong claim. And this is not a claim made by a Silicon Valley insider. This is, comes from across the Atlantic. Venture capital has made Silicon Valley, <clears throat> this is a big claim, the most durably productive crucible of applied science anywhere ever. You wanna see what the gap is? This is where I think we start seeing some of the fundamental reasons here. Here is the gap from the Draghi report between funding at every level of venture capital, seed, um, a round, and then growth funding. It varies a little bit, but VC funding is at about 20% of the US level. So again, this is an inexact calculation, but the gap here is somewhere around 4.5x. This is a huge gap. And we need to understand why the gap is that big, because I believe that without a VC ecosystem, you have real trouble with a, creating a large and growing high-tech ecosystem. Great. Uh, potential gap number three. Another thing that could be going on is that Europe could be having difficulty turning VC investment into valuable, high-growth startups, especially in the tech space. How many of us think this is a big problem? All right, great. I fooled some of you at least a little bit. Let me show you a couple different ways to look at this. Here is a visualization of unicorns in the United States versus the EU. Unicorn, as most of us know, is a startup, still private, valued at at least one billion, I'll use dollars. So here's what the picture looks like. Here's the US versus the EU, and the US cluster <clears throat> is a lot bigger. Everything that's blue there is Silicon Valley. Again, Malibu's quote is accurate. Silicon Valley is unprecedented. There's nothing else like it in the world. But the rest of the United States is doing fairly well too, and there's the European cluster. Oh, that's a big difference. However, that gap in size between those two clusters is not that much bigger than the VC funding gap. So compared to US funding, VC funding is at 20%. The total value of unicorns is at 14%. Okay, that's a serious drop off, but it's not, it, it's not the same level as the first two columns that we see here. So this gap is meaningful, but it's not gigantic. Given the VC funding in Europe, the EU is doing a pretty good job at creating those really uh, fantastic unicorns that might be the drivers of future growth. All right, last comparison here. Is it inability to turn those startups, those unicorns, into valuable public EU companies? How many of us think this is a big gap? Okay, you were, you were cautious after the last one, I see. Let me show you a very similar visualization in the gap about turning high-growth private companies into high-growth young public companies. I got inspired to draw this one by the Draghi Report. <clears throat> This is a big gap. So what Draghi highlighted in the report, which I was not aware of, was that there have been no zero companies started from scratch, not the result of a merger or a JV or a spin out, in the past 50 years in Europe that have reached 100 billion euro in market capitalization. Ow, zero. So I took that down, one order of magnitude. Here are all of the from scratch public companies in the EU valued at 10 billion or more. That's that little cluster. <clears throat> the big one over there is what's going on in the United States. It's hard to visually compare the previous 
cluster visualization versus this one. So let me make it very easy. If the United States is at 100, the EU is at 1.4. So the gap between those last two columns, between the, global, the total value of unicorns and the total value of young public companies, that's a 10x gap. That is a real gap. And I suggest, and I wanna leave you with this, that the homework, the, the important homework that this member of Team Liberal Democratic West has is to figure out why those gaps, why those two gaps are as large as, we, as they are. So we've got very large gaps in VC investment. And I think venture capital investment is, a, is very much a leading indicator of the health of the Thai high-tech ecosystem. And then in turning young and growing young public companies that are going to change things and innovate and disrupt things. And so the question is, of course, what's going on here? Why are those gaps as large as they are? And there's a massive discussion around this. I think there needs to be more discussion around this, but this is my short list of things that are very different and that are impeding the progress and causing the gaps that we see. My list includes, includes way too much regulation, includes uh, labor force rigidity, includes restraints on your ability to form legal forms that lead to high growth and lead to people wanting to invest in it. And then finally, taxation burdens, as I understand it, are fairly different between several European countries and the US. And the question I wanna leave you with, and that I think we're gonna have some chance to talk about because I'm, I'm joining, um, uh, Minister Halbeck on, uh, Halbeck on stage in just a little while. A question that I want to ask him and that I want to ask everybody here. Is the EU willing to do what it takes to close these gaps? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Thank you very much.